This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Africa's changing dynamics are calling for great statesmanship and leadership. And few are better placed to answer questions about the continent's decades-long pursuit of growth and development than our guest today, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni. Since taking office in 1986, President Museveni has guided the country to rise from the ashes of a civil war into a society of stability and development. Today, he shares with us his journey into leadership and his dream for Africa's future. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Before we start our interview, let's first get to know the man who has been at the helm of Uganda for 22 years. After toppling Amin and winning the ensuing five-year Bush War on January the 29th, 1986, Museveni was sworn in as Uganda's new president. During his inaugural address, he said, this is not a mere change of guard, it is a fundamental change. Since then, he's led Uganda to transform it into one of East Africa's most stable countries. Under his rule, the Ugandan economy has stabilized and he's been able to battle key challenges such as inflation and balance of payments. In 2017, Uganda's GDP growth registered a seven-year high of 6%. President Museveni has also been credited with bringing the HIV-AIDS epidemic in Uganda under control. Through his leadership, Uganda has become a major regional player in maintaining peace and security, particularly in the negotiations for the peace process in South Sudan. In 2017, he was awarded the prestigious African Liberation Prize for his role in peacekeeping efforts in Africa. President Museveni has won all the elections in Uganda since 1986. In 2018, a new law removing the age limit has paved the way for him to stand election again in 2021. Your Excellency, thank you very much for um, your time. It's been a long journey to where you are today. I'd like you to take us back to how it all started for you, to your childhood. What were some of your most memorable uh, times as you were growing up and how did you get where you are and what inspired you from the beginning? Well, childhood was uh, about uh, our traditional ways of life, which was cattle keeping. Uh, along the way, we, we got into modern education. Uh, that time, the target was to get education so that either you work for the government or you improve your uh, farming activities. However, along the way, we got into political crisis, uh, especially uh, the government's uh, killing people, extrajudicial killings, and then also uh, not accepting the power of the population. Uh, democracy and that's how now we had to change to go from just farming and working for the government uh, and start uh, struggling for uh, getting rid of these problems from our country. At what point did you yourself though decide that uh, you wanted to get involved in politics? Well, we could say around, from even when I was in the secondary school, I was already involved. I was a, a youth, a youth a winger of one of the political parties. Now, the big problem we had at that time was people exploiting the politics of identity, of tribe, of religion. Now, by 1965, which is like 53 years ago, that's when we formed the first uh, non-sectarian student group where we, we started the, the campaign against uh, uh, politics of identity. Uh, uh, th then eventually when the government collapsed, because the, the government had uh, f three crises 
or four, the one of 1964, when the coalition collapsed, there was a coalition of some of two political parties. When it collapsed, the one of 1966, when there was a fight between uh, the, the prime minister and uh, one of the kings here, and then the one of 1969, when uh, uh, the prime minister was shot, uh, Obote, and then 1971, when Amir came into government. Uh, so along the way, we were consolidating our student group. Uh, and by 1971, when Amin came into government, that's when we decided to go from uh, peaceful politics to, to fighting. Uh, so that is the history. So when you went from peaceful politics to fighting, there were people that you fought alongside, um, you know, during that period, you were in that war in the 70s, in the 80s. There were leaders across Africa that probably impacted uh, your position. Who were some of those people that impacted what you did at the time? Well, we could say indirectly we had some example from the f freedom fighters in Mozambique. Uh, our, our reasoning was that if they could fight the colonial armies, how can we fail to fight our local uh, dictators? Uh, you could say they influenced us, not directly, but uh, indirectly by example. Mm. Right, so when we get to 1986, um, and I want to go to your inauguration on January of 1986, and you said, as Uganda was changing, as you were taking over, you said, this is not a mere change of guard, it is a fundamental change. How big has that change been for Uganda in your eyes? There are very many elements of that change. The first one was to go from the politics of identity to the politics of interests. Do you speak Swahili? I speak Swahili. I'm from Kenya. Uh, the, the, what we call in Swahili, Maslahi. Maslahi. Maslahi, Awanaji. Yes. So we should uh, concentrate on uh, interests rather than a city. A city, a city Yamutu, the identity of, uh, of, of a person. It doesn't matter who you, who you are, what religion, but what are your leg the leg legitimate interests, like prosperity. We want all our families to be prosperous. They need to sell their products, to sell their services. So the politics should be around organizing for them infrastructure markets so that they sell their products and become prosperous. That's what politics should be about, not about uh, this religion, that, that uh, tribe. So that was one of the fundamental changes uh, in, in our politics. Then, of course, we had a disciplined army. One of the problems of, of Uganda was a, a very indisciplined army, which was also sectarian, uh, based on tribes again. And then uh, education, we have launched massive education and, uh, and other elements, infrastructure, commercializing agriculture, industrialization, uh, economic integration in Africa to make Africa one uh, economically but e even politically. We, we, we aim at the East African Federation so these were the fundamental positions we were insisting on, rather than the politics of uh, who you are and wh which religion you belong to. And, and that is uh, one of the graces, of course, of, of uh, Uganda when you look at it compared to your neighbor Kenya, and, and I'm saying that from a position where the politics of uh, tribe is still very much the key there. When it comes to politics and democracy, the politics of Africa is not a one-fit-all because South Africa and Ethiopia have a very strong party system. You look at Kenya with very strong uh, tribal systems, you look at Botswana and Rwanda with a different system, and you also look at Swaziland, which is still a monarchy. When it comes to African politics, what is your view, though, on what model Africa should adopt? As you say, we cannot have uh, a shoe which fits all, but the, to have a healthy situation, 
it's really to how uh, it's really good to have politics based on the popular will of the people. Whether the popular will is, is expressed through parties or through what they call proportional representation, that's a detail. But the the fundamental basis is that the people should be uh, should elect their governments at regular intervals. Mm. When we elect our governments at regular intervals, of course, there, there, there has been that debate, particularly from Western countries, as to exactly how Africa should um, elect and at what position or at what time that uh, mandate should be put there. What is your take when it comes to Uganda? No, the, the, those are mistaken positions. What is crucial is substance, not form. Uh, what some of the people talk about are, are simply forms. But the substance is, do you have elections by secret ballot, free elections by secret ballot at regular intervals? That's what is the minimum, in my opinion. Do you see that working for Africa? Yes, it, 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 it should. It should because the Africans are people who know how to choose what is bad and what is good. Uh, and even when they make mistakes, they can correct it. You, you are talking about Kenya. Kenya had, had gone into uh, tribal politics, but you can see they are gradually getting out because uh, they have found that, uh, uh, that it has got problems. What is your view, though, of uh, Uganda's political future? Political future of Uganda is, is, is good because we, we solved uh, all the issues in the past, when we give power to the people, that's this is the, uh, and, uh, uh, there's some corruption which we are struggling with, but that's also not a problem because there is a way out. I, I, if people will vote you out, if, if you become unpopular, so that's not a problem really, which is not, which is incurable. Right, I, I do want to come uh, back briefly to the status of your country because you gave the BBC an interview in 2011 and you said you wanted to leave two things in your legacy. One of them was the social economic transformation of Uganda and the second was turning the country into a first world and an East African federation. How successful do you think you have been on those two fronts? Well, on the East African federation, we are working with our, our brothers in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in South Sudan. Uh, you could go to Arusha and they tell you how far we have gone. Uh, I am told they have now agreed on the idea of a, a confederation. So that one is moving. Uh, the, the, co the common market is doing very well. We have, a, we have the common market, we have the customs union. Those are working well. Uh, it is the other two stages that we are still targeting, the monetary union and the, the, the political federation. But what we have covered is, is, is good. Uh, about social economic transformation, uh, the literacy rate in Uganda today is 75%. It used to be 40%. Life expectancy has gone to 63. Three years instead of 40, 43, it has gone up 20 years. In spite of the AIDS epidemic, so you can imagine what, what it would have been if we did not have the problem of AIDS. Uh, so we are moving, we are moving, we are moving well. But in the region though, you still have a lot of problems or the region still has a lot of problems from uh, South Sudan now. As a leading member of IGAD though, uh, what is your take on the ongoing uh, South Sudan uh, peace talks in Addis? Well, the, 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 the politics of South Sudan is precisely what, what one should not do uh, because it is based on uh, sectarianism of, of the region, of, 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 of especially of tribe, of tribe in the, in the case of South Sudan. That's where the problem is. Mm. Is the region though becoming fatigued with uh, the South Sudanese crisis, or, or are eager member states, eager member states, going to continue with that up to the end? They can't be fatigued. We were not fatigued with the problem of South Africa, which went on for years. We were not pro fatigued with the problems of. Uh, uh, of the slave trade. Slave trade went on for 300 years. We shall continue, continue until it will, it will be solved. Let's take a short break and when we come back we will hear the President's insights on a number of issues that the continent faces today. Stay with us.
China Global Television Network from broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms, and social media. CGTN. See the difference. And before we continue my conversation with President Museveni, earlier my colleague Lee Qianhua also spoke with the President. They discussed China-Uganda and China-African relations. Let's take a listen. Uh, first of all, the Chinese uh, Communist Party supported us when we were fighting against uh, colonialism right from 1949. We also supported them in their struggle for their rights in the United Nations. We have therefore been cooperating with China ever since 1949, when there was a, a new leadership. Uh, in recent times, uh, China supported Africa in fighting the uh, colonial regimes in Southern Africa. After that, we are now cooperating with China in infrastructure. They have given us uh, soft loans for building uh, two, two dams, Karuma and Simba. Uh, they have also given us a soft loan for the Entebbe Expressway and for the International Airport. One of the big ones which is in the pipeline is the, East, uh, the Uganda Railway, Standard Gauge Railway, uh, from Kenya to Kampala, from Kampala to the border with Congo, uh, to the border with Rwanda, and eventually to the border with the Sudan. This one we, shall have, we don't have to do all of them with the soft loans from China. Uh, uh, many of them we shall finance ourselves but we cooperate uh, by providing co co contract uh, labor on good terms by the Chinese companies, Chinese uh, uh, railway building companies. Uh, we also, using our own money, hire Chinese companies for doing uh, road works, upgrading. You have lower transport costs, lower electricity costs. Uh, that means uh, more companies will be attracted to come to Uganda because they will be able to make more profit. And uh, they, they will create more jobs. Uh, they, they will earn uh, uh, foreign currency for the country. Uh, it is a benefit in so many areas, jobs, exports. Uh, besides, they have uh, opened for us uh, zero tax at zero tax rate and uh, without quota uh, Chinese market for 440 products. We are therefore very happy. Uh, we also buy a lot of things from China. Uh, the value of our, our imports from China is like $800 million a year. So we are cooperating very much for mutual benefit. What we, we would want is for them to open their markets more for our products. I do want uh, Your Excellency to talk a bit about what my colleague mentioned earlier on, that is the uh, forum on China-Africa cooperation, because China has now overtaken the West as uh, Africa's leading uh, trade and investment partner since 2009, um, although uh, the balance of trade is still uh, very much in favor of, of, of China. How can Africa make this a win-win cooperation? By, by, by pr pr producing for export. Because the Chinese buy a lot of things from outside, and Africa can supply them. 
what we should uh, uh, demand from the Chinese is for them to allow our exports into China. They have already, uh, already allowed some, but we want more. That's all. The, the, the rest we shall, we shall sort out. Because the upcoming uh, Forum on China-Africa cooperation is going to provide African leadership a platform where they can um, speak in one voice. What is it that African leaders are going to be going to Beijing with? Well, my proposal to, uh, to, to them uh, is I, I normally talk of uh, what I call ITT, uh, investments, trade, and tourism. That's what we would need from China. Bring investments if you can. Let us trade with you as we are doing now, but do it in a balanced way. Bring tourists. That, that would be a simple formula of how we can uh, cooperate with China. With the CFTA, uh, now there's going to be a market of 1.2 billion for, uh, for Africa here, though 44 countries already have uh, signed up. How do you see this cooperation between China and Africa being impacted by the CFTA? Of course it will be very much impacted because that means uh, Africa becomes one market and uh, it's, uh, it, it, will, it is 1.2 one, one, 1 billion now, but it will be, we shall be uh, 2.5 billion very soon. Uh, Africa is the continent of the future, as long as we solve our problems. So anybody who wants to do serious business will have to, to work with Africa. What do you make, though, of the West's concerns that uh, perhaps Africa is taking on too much debt uh, from China because um, China is heavily invested in Africa's infrastructure, in its railways, in its ports? What do you make of, of that assertion? That's not, uh, that's not uh, correct because the, the potential of Africa is very big. It's much bigger than this electoral debt they are talking about. The potential. You borrow to invest in order to, to unleash the potential. What is the potential? You ask them, those who talk to you like that, what is the potential of Uganda? If all the Ugandans wake up, how much will they produce? How about Kenya? So they shouldn't look at, at this small debt. How much is the debt, even if it is 10 billion, 20 billion? The potential of Africa is much, much bigger than, than that. Unless they misuse the money and they don't develop the uh, they don't use the money to unleash the potential. That's where the problem can be. But otherwise, the money by itself, if it is properly used, uh, it has no, it is, it is very good. And global dynamics are now changing as well. Uh, China being part of uh, the BRICS uh, countries here. What are your expectations, though, with the upcoming BRICS summit? What do you see uh, as the impact that the BRICS uh, uh, system has had on Africa? The, 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 the BRICS or any international orga organization uh, should focus on prosperity for all of us uh, through trade of goods and services and in some uh, cases investment like I said. Uh, if, we, if we focus on uh, uh, balanced prosperity for all of us, no selfishness, no, no, no desire to take advantage of, of others, uh, then everybody will be, will be all right because b business will grow, will grow. For instance, if China buys our textiles, that means we get money. Then we also buy something from China because we have money from what they bought from us. But if, we do, if, if they only export to us and we don't export to them, in the end the trade will not expand <laughs> because we shall have no money in our pockets. If we don't have money in our pockets, our purchasing power is, is, is low. So we can't buy more from uh, China or from the United States or from wh whoever. So it is, uh, w when China was developing uh, f from being a poor country to being a, a rich country, the price of steel went up. 
the price of copper went up. Uh, the price of cement went up. The price of cotton went up. So we benefited. The prosperity of China uh, uh, benefited us because we, we, they, they were demanding more things, more copper for electricity, more steel for, 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 for infrastructure, more cement, more cotton for factories, ah, and we, we, we were benefiting from that prosperity. So universal prosperity will benefit everybody. The idea that uh, you should have a few islands of prosperity surrounded by a sea of backwardness is, 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 is stupid. It is not a, a clever idea. It is by people who don't see far. So you have watched Africa's evolution from mm -hmm. the liberation days onto the democratic days, onto uh, you know, the, the, the free market economy kind of system. Take us back to how you have viewed Africa's uh, trajectory over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Well, when we, when we, we had a, a meeting with Japan, with Japan in Nairobi, uh, I pointed out 10 bottlenecks, and I can give, my people can give you a copy. Uh, Africa has delayed somehow because they were not identifying all the bottlenecks. They would identify one of the bottlenecks or two and forget about the others. But uh, my view is that you need to handle all of them at the same time, the 10 bottlenecks. They, they are mentioned in that speech, they will give it to you, you, you will see it. For instance, uh, I told you about ideology. If you emphasize identity, a city, and you forget the Maasai interest, that's a mistake. You will run into problems. Uh, if you do not concentrate on the issue of the market, integrating the African market, because Africa is a big market of 1.2 billion people, but it is fragmented by the colonial boundaries. So if you don't bring, me, I'm a milk producer. I produce milk. But the price of milk had collapsed. Why? Because Uganda is now producing 2.5 billion liters of milk, but the Ugandans are drinking only 800 million liters. So there's a surplus of 1.7 billion. Now, if it, was, if it was not for East Africa and Congo, my prosperity would have collapsed. We must form the regional blocks, the commercials, the ECOWAS. In the past, they were not identified. They would identify, for instance, education. Education, education, education. But if you educate people, but they have no jobs. Why, why don't they have jobs? Because there are no factories. Why are there no factories? Because the electricity is not there. So what will be the use of education? What, they will end up being part of the diaspora. They, they will have to mi migrate and, and, and go to look part of the brain drain. They call it a brain drain. So you need to handle the, all, all, all the bottlenecks together. That was the problem, in my opinion, from my almost 60 years of watching uh, what has been happening in Africa. As you continue leading Uganda, and when you look into the future, what kind of a legacy would you want to leave for Uganda? The legacy is for Uganda to understand the 10 bottlenecks and deal with them, uh, together with our brothers in, in, in Africa. That's, that's what I want. Mm. Your Excellency, thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. Asante. And that's all we have time for this week. Remember to join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.